is welded rail. This film shows two methods of welding rail and how the completed rail is unloaded and laid. Santa Fe's electric flashbutt welding setup on two adjacent tracks at Albuquerque, New Mexico was the first on any American railroad. Three 50-foot steel box cars contain the basic equipment for generation of current and for welding and grinding operations. This permits rapid and economical establishment of the electric welding plant at any location where there is sufficient trackage. A seven and a half ton crane moves rail from flat cars onto steel skids placed ahead of the box car containing the welding unit. As each rail reaches the bottom of the skids, pneumatic dogs lift the rail and place it on rollers for movement into the welding car. To ensure proper electrode contact, both ends of each rail are ground and polished, top and bottom, to remove mill scale or other undesirable material. Electric flash butt welding is one of the types of resistance welding in which the parts are welded together by the combined use of heat and pressure. The heat is generated by a relatively short time flow of low voltage, high density electric current across the location of the joint to be made. The current used in this operation is 640 volts, 40 cycles, supplied by a 960 kVA diesel generator in an adjacent box car. As each weld is completed, the string of rails is moved ahead 39 feet so that the next weld location can be clamped in the machine. To avoid offsets or crooked welds, the operator must position and match the rail ends carefully. Using a straight edge, he places shims under the electrodes as needed. When the rail ends are positioned, they are put under clamping pressure of 120 tons and upsetting pressure of 45 tons. In making the weld, about three-eighths of an inch of each rail end is flashed away. Ordinarily, of course, the hood on the machine is kept closed. But for the purpose of this film, to show the considerable sparking generated by the process, let's open the hood. In this scene, the shear has already been moved into position and clamped between the electrodes on the right hand or movable end of the welder. Ragged flash remaining on the ball, bottom and sides of the rail is sheared while still at high temperature. The operator removes loose portions of flash with tongs. This year, an improved shear will permit us to take off all flash, including that on the web and the top of the base. A winch located in the second car moves the rail ahead for each succeeding weld. As the rail is advanced, flash is removed by hand from the web in the top of the base. This hand operation will be eliminated by the improved shear. The weld moves directly from the welding machine to the grinder car for finishing. Since the rail is heated for only a short distance at the upset, no stress relieving is required for welds. Hence no normalizing machine is needed. This first stop in the grinder car is the base grinder which smooths the weld on the bottom and each side of the base. The base grinder has three grinding wheels, one of which is mounted horizontally and two vertically. Next, the semi-automatic grinding machine smooths the weld on the head of the rail. The position of the grinding wheel is regulated by two dollies. The dollies engage the rail on either side of the weld and follow the contour of the rail head during the grinding operation. The rail now moves forward another 39 feet to the final grinding station where excess or flash metal is removed from the web and the top of the base. This station was housed at Albuquerque in a 10 foot by 10 foot prefabricated metal building. Grinders were powered by electric motors but a semi-automatic machine now in construction will take over the hand operation used here. Last step for the welded rail before loading is a second 10 by 10 metal building in which the welded rail is tested by Magnaflux. The Magnaflux is used to test the high quality of the weld. 
The jig which holds the contact prods against the rail was developed by Santa Fe personnel. It enables one man to handle a job which formerly required the services of two. When the weld has had its final check for alignment, the rail moves on to a train of flat cars passing over a series of roller bearing rollers. The end rail sections of each string of 37 rails have been drilled for standard joint bars to facilitate laying and track. Now, to keep the winch pulling continuously as the rail strings are loaded, these rail ends are tied together temporarily. One man guides each rail into its proper space. With 12 strings of rail loaded, the train of 32 flat cars is started off to the rail relay location. Another train of flat cars is immediately switched into position at the welding setup. En route to the rail relay location, the work train, loaded with rails each 1,440 feet long, moves easily through switches and around curves and enters sidings without difficulty. On a number 10 turnout, with curvature of 6 degrees in 5 minutes, the long rails take it smoothly adjusting themselves with slight longitudinal and lateral movements. Santa Fe also welded 63 miles of rail by the oxacetylene process during the past year in a double assembly line setup at Needles, California. In this setup, welds are fabricated on the long rails in two parallel lines 12 feet apart. For maximum economy, we generate our own acetylene with two type MP11 sets of equipment using size 1 quarter by 12 carbide. Each generator has a capacity of 500 pounds of carbide. Each produces 1,000 cubic feet of acetylene per hour. Erected side by side, the generators are serviced by a one ton overhead chain hoist. Carbide in a movable hopper is taken to each generator in turn. At the beginning of the double assembly line, rail is moved from stockpiles and placed on rail skids at the head of each line. Rail is moved from skid locations by hand and positioned at the saw station where two rail ends are trimmed in one location. Only a small amount of metal is cut away as it is necessary only to square up the ends and clean them, presenting a bright surface for the welding which follows. In the welding machine, adjoining rail ends at the weld location are heated by oxyacetylene flame. Each machine is equipped with blocks incorporating 125 tips for even flame distribution. Uniformity is further assured by flame movement, the machine having a one and three quarter inch stroke during the heating period. When the proper temperature is reached, rail ends are forced together with 20 tons of pressure and considerable flash of excess metal occurs around the rail's perimeter. At the next station, an oxyacetylene cutting torch trims off excess metal. A jig is used to govern the amount of metal trimmed away and to prevent gouging into the surface of the original contour of the rail. Moving along, the rail is normalized in a machine which also has blocks of tips to direct flame to all parts of the weld. The normalizing machine has a six inch stroke. To allow the weld to cool after normalizing, the string of welded rail is taken along for 178 feet before it reaches the first grinding station. In the initial grinding operation, excess metal is removed from the top and sides of the ball of the rail. The grinding machine has a five horsepower electric motor and a two inch by eight inch grinding wheel. In the next operation, excess metal is ground from the base of the rail at the weld. A hand operation, this step depends for success upon the skill of the operator. At the final grinding station, excess metal is removed from the web and top of the base. The ball is given a final polishing, the rail is checked for straightness, and each weld is tested for defects by Magnaflux. When 12 strings of rail have been loaded, the train is switched out of the track and replaced by a set of empties. An anchoring device on the middle car of the train clamps each rail against longitudinal shift while permitting free movement of rail ends as the train moves around curves. 
As an added precaution, a car of volcanic cinder ballast used in that territory was placed behind the engine and another ahead of the caboose as a protection in case of longitudinal shift. Two diesels handle a 32-car work train carrying the rails and a car holding a seven and a half ton crane. Train and rails encountered no difficulty on grades and curves. At the rail relay site, the crane is unloaded and proceeds to place the caisson on the track for unloading the welded rail. This caisson was developed by Roadmaster Coy Delft from an old freight car truck. It is equipped with outriggers for installing the threaders at a proper distance from the main track so that the welded rail can be directed to its position on the embankment shoulders. The threaders have one hinged side for convenience in inserting or removing rail. Movements are precisely controlled by radio communication. Using a pack set, the unloading crew maintains contact with the engineer in his radio equipped locomotive. When the outside rail has been disengaged from the anchoring device, the crane pulls it through the threader on the rear flat car. The rail is then put through the threader on the caisson. Once the rail is threaded, the operation is actually that of pulling the train out from under each long rail or pair of rails. The anchoring device we mentioned earlier is installed on the middle car of the train. Two 18-inch steel channels are bolted to the deck. Machine bolts are brought up from the channels between each rail to engage steel clips resting on top of the rail. Two rails are thus unclamped for unloading when the nuts are removed from the bolts. Trenches are dug in advance through road crossings and motor car set-offs to speed unloading and shorten main track occupancy by the work train. After much practice, crews were able to locate trenches where the rail would most often fall into it almost automatically. The caisson is towed by a cable arrangement about 50 feet behind the end of the last flat car. To counteract pressure of the rails which would tend to force it too far forward, the caisson is equipped with brakes for partial application. As the end of each long rail reaches the rear car, opposite the end of the next rail to be unloaded, the two drilled ends are connected temporarily with steel plates, held by finger-tight bolts. This permits a fairly continuous operation, with only minor delays for fastening the plates. It also eliminates the need to reinsert new rails in the threaders. And now we proceed to the process of laying welded rail. In this operation, a 112-pound jointed rail was replaced with a 136-pound welded rail. Two bolt machines remove bolts from the four-hole joint bars. This begins the process of removal of the old rail. Laying continuous welded rail is similar to the laying of jointed rail in many ways. The principal changes are in the elimination of joint bar application every 39 feet and in the actual placing of rail onto the tie plate. Following the bolt machines, one man removes bolts and joint bars, placing one of the bars in the center of the track. Such bars will serve as a landing field for the strings of welded rail. The seven and a half ton crane follows, lifting the long rail from the embankment shoulder to the center of the track, where it is placed on the old joint bars, which have been spaced several rail lengths apart. The crane takes a new hitch approximately every 50 feet. Three spike pullers, each operated by three men, remove from the ties the spikes which have held the old jointed rail. A trailer is used as a movable shop for grinding adzer bits and placing them in the adzer heads. As the adzer heads are prepared, one man drops them off to be picked up. Field repair on bits eliminates carrying these tools back and forth from the camps and keeps adzers in good condition. Two men with rail forks then line the old rail out onto the ballast shoulder. Behind them come four men removing tie plates from the top of the ties, throwing them onto the shoulder to be picked up later. Then six men insert creosoted wood tie plugs into the old spike holes in the ties 
and drive them home with a specially built 20 pound tie plug hammers. Two one wheel cribbers remove ballast in cribs adjacent to each tie plate location to facilitate adzing and the rail anchor application. Shin guards are used by these men to protect themselves against flying pieces of ballast. Tops of the ties at tie plate locations are given a fresh, smooth surface by three adzers. A self-propelled spray machine creosotes the adzed surface immediately. Laborers follow and lay new tie plates in approximate position. Tie plates are then positioned exactly by a tie plate lining machine which also carries a tray for handling and distributing hold down studs. Two studs are distributed every fifth tie and after gauging every fifth plate is pinned to the top of the tie. Tie plates are held in precise position by a track gauging machine. A double spindle tie borer incorporated in the machine drills two holes in the tie. Two studs are placed in these drilled holes and driven home by two men using headache sticks or potato mashers to pin plates into exact position. This machine has a sliding shoe adjustable to the exact distance between shoulders in the given tie plate design. This shoe positions plates exactly to standard gauge. A separate track and roller arrangement permits uniform forward motion of the machine without interference in the tie boring operation. A speed swing machine mounted on rubber tires places welded rail in its final position on the tie plates. Two men using bars guide the rail between the tie plate shoulders. Operated by one man, the speed swing machine takes a new hitch approximately every 39 feet. New spikes distributed as the rail is laid are positioned by hand for pneumatic spikers which follow. Each spike driver operator has a spare man to relieve him at specified intervals. A 315 cubic foot track mounted air compressor powers the four pneumatic spike drivers. Distributed from a trailer, two rail anchors then are placed at every other tie. Our anchoring pattern is termed box anchoring. Rail anchors are applied on each side of alternate ties. In other words, each alternate tie is boxed between two anchors. Service tests have proved the practicability of welded rail as a maintenance saving proposition and elimination of the rail joint necessary every 39 feet in conventional rail also makes for a smoother ride with less noise. Or as one editorial writer said recently, the clickety-clack is being taken out of railroading.